Good morning, everyone. This is Joshua Cohen from Giant Innovation coming to you from New York. Yes, this is actually a virtual background. Thank you all for attending today. Really looking forward to today's panel. By way of background, as many of you know, or as I'm sure you've observed, we are in a crisis, an unprecedented crisis, which is impacting us socially, economically, politically. But one of kind of the bright spots about this panel is that the technology and innovation ecosystem seems to be rising to the challenge. Right? Every day we hear about things like masks that are made by small companies, ventilators, tools to allow children to be educated at home. And so the goal of this panel is essentially to look at the innovation ecosystem and ask that question, what is it doing to solve or resolve or mitigate this current crisis? And how effective is it actually? And so it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to kind of just give you a quick overview of our panelists. If we could share my screen, unfortunately it looks like my screen sharing is deactivated. Could you activate that? No, you can't, no problem at all. We will do it without the screen sharing. So we have four wonderful panelists today. Um, Linus Dallander, Gulza Vicka, Vicka, Joanne Halpern, and of course, Sean Stewart. They will be joining us in just a moment. But before we do that, I'd like to thank our sponsors for this event, who I have the pleasure of being intimately familiar with and affiliated with. And by the way, I now have screen sharing functionality, so I will show you my screen. And if you can see this, the years are our four panelists, and again, our sponsors who I have the pleasure of being affiliated. First and foremost, ESMT Berlin, I believe ranked number one business school in Germany by Financial Times. The Atlantic Brücke, one of the preeminent transatlantic organizations, and finally, Giant Innovation, where I work, where I am the head of the European practice, working with large organizations on helping them to become more creative, more nimble, and more agile. Before we get to our panelists, we'd like to have a word from our sponsors. And so first we'd like to hear from David Deisner, who is the head of the Atlantic Brücke out of Berlin. David? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Josh. Thank you so much. Um, um, let me open my window here. Um, yeah, uh, dear friends of ESMT and Atlantic Brücke, um, would like to give a very warm welcome to, to all of you to the virtual panel. Um, and Josh, as you just uh, said, we'll focus on the question what the technology and innovation ecosystem can bring to mitigate the current crisis. Um, I think there is no doubt that in this time of crisis, we actually really put to the test. Will we be able uh, to use the digital, digital tools uh, to contain the pandemic and thus to serve the common good and most importantly we will be able to cooperate across borders and across the Atlantic. Uh, many academics, entrepreneurs and private actors have been working flat out on innovative solutions in recent months. Uh, the famous Corona app is just one of many helpful solutions in this context of course but a digital solution must not only be available it must also be socially accepted. So we are facing a communication challenge here as well I think uh, for example, many people still believe that the Corona app, the German version of which is due to be launched in June, stores location data, which it doesn't. Um, I assume that these and, and other related questions might be raised in today's dis discussion, and I look forward to a stimulating uh, transatlantic exchange on, on this important topic. I would like to thank, uh, of course, Professor Rocho, the president of ESMT, for this uh, uh, great opportunity to cooperate. And thank you, of, of course, to you, Josh, for moderating today's call and for your initiative. We are proud to say that you are a young leader alum of Atlantic Brücke, um, as is today's panelist, Gulta Wilke from Axel Springer. Uh, many thanks also to our distinguished speakers, Professor Linus Valanda and uh, Joan Halpern and John Stewart. Thank you very much for joining us. That's it for me. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. And over to Jörg Ruckel, president of the ESMT in Berlin. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, it's great to be 
uh, again among friends in uh, co-hosting uh, this event. Uh, it's really a great pleasure uh, given that uh, we join or we have a joint uh, history um, of many uh, of these joint um, initiatives, be it in, in conferences, events, but also working together on the teaching side. So it's really a great pleasure that we can do this again. And uh, in particular, I'm very delighted to see that we um, talk about a topic um, that is obviously of utmost importance in this current situation. Um, innovation is uh, needed more than ever. We see this in all dimensions. We see it in uh, particular in the medical field, uh, but we see it also uh, more broadly in many other parts uh, when it comes, for example, uh, about to the uh, supply chains, uh, how shall um, companies source uh, their inputs going forward? How robust uh, should supply chains be, uh, production facilities be? Um, and at the same time, we also see a shift, you could say, from value to growth, even more than we had seen before. Um, so you could say that uh, the current uh, crisis even accelerates certain trends we had seen before, um, also with lots of questions that far, go far beyond purely economic perspective. So uh, looking also at um, the weights certain economies have in the world going forward across the Atlantic and beyond. So uh, thus, um, it's a fantastic panel. These are fantastic cooperation partners and uh, we are very delighted to be part of this. Thank you so much and I really look very much to a very inspiring discussion. Thank you so much, Jörg Rochel. Great. And now let us meet our panelists. So if our panelists could join us, I will take the opportunity to introduce them one by one. First of all, we have Linus Dallander, who is a professor and Lufthansa Group Chair in Innovation at ESMT in Berlin. I actually have taught in the MBA program at ESMT in the past, and I can tell you that the students absolutely love Linus and his classes. So welcome, Linus. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad the students like me. I hope they <laughs> like me as much as they like you. <laughs> Terrific. Oh, thank you. Terrific. And now on to our other German representative, Gulzo Wilke, who's the head of portfolio operations and business development at Axel Springer in Berlin. Hello, Gulzo. How are you? Fine. Thanks a lot. And also thank you to David for pointing out that I'm a very proud uh, young leader alumna from last year, actually. Yes. Yeah. As am I. It was a terrific experience. So thank you for that. Definitely. Um, next, Joanne Halpern, a friend of mine from New York, who is a director of the Hassel Plattner Institute in New York and also an adjunct professor at NYU. So she kind of touches the technology and the innovation and the education side. Good morning, Joanne. Good morning, Josh. And thanks to the organizers for inviting all of us. Terrific. Great. And last but not least, another friend of mine from New York, Sean Stewart, who is the CEO of New Lab, which is really, in my opinion, the preeminent tech center in New York, actually based out in Brooklyn. Good morning, Sean. Good to see you, Josh. Thanks for having me. Of course. Great to have you. Um, so look, over the next 40 minutes, we want to dive deep with each of these panelists on kind of what they're seeing, what they're doing when it comes to innovation and resolving the current crisis. We have representatives from both sides of the Atlantic. So maybe you yourself can compare, see what's going on, and try to learn a little bit about what the future may bring. So without further ado, why don't we just take a minute, panelists, and why don't you introduce yourself? We'll start off with Linus and just tell a little bit about yourself and what you do. So I'm Linus, I'm Swedish, hence my singing accent. Uh, I grew up on the countryside with, in a village with more cows than people. Um, I was trained in Sweden, I did my postdoc at Stanford, I was at Imperial College, and I came to Berlin 10 years ago. Um, I'm a professor of strategy and I do research on innovation and entrepreneurship. And I usually work very closely with companies to get access to companies to come up with cool projects that I can publish, but also say something for managerial practice. Great, perfect. Uh, let's move on to Sean Stewart from New Lab. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Yes, yeah, so I'm Sean Stewart. I'm the CEO of New Lab. As Josh mentioned, we're based in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, a couple minute ferry ride to Wall Street or 34th Street, kind of between Dumbo and Williamsburg, if you know New York City and Brooklyn overall. Uh, we run a community of 850 different technologists, inventors, entrepreneurs, and researchers. Uh, they're currently building about 156 different startups uh, at New Lab, um, all utilizing frontier technology of some category. Everything from AI and machine learning, self-driving cars, quantum computers, 
biofabrication, uh, almost kind of any unique technology, technology that's being developed today. Um, we also run innovation and venture studios. Innovation studios partner with corporations to help utilize that type of talent and our access to that type of talent to help resolve their problems, find inefficiencies in their business or open new revenue streams. And then we run venture studios, which are actually building new companies um, for a specific client with a specific intent or opportunity in mind. Um, so we're really excited to be here. Before New Lab, I was at Google X and worked on Project Chauffeur for three and a half years, uh, developing the self-driving car um, and excited to be back in New York. Really interesting background, Sean. Thank you. Guza, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself? Sure, happy to do so. So I'm Gulcha Wilke. I'm an investor and head of portfolio at Axel Springer. For those of you that might not know Axel Springer, we are one of the world's largest media companies. You might know Business Insider, Political Europe, or Welt and Build for the German-speaking um, audience here. And I'm also heading our pricing team and I'm a supervisory board member of Stepstone and this company you all should know if you're looking for great employees because we are one of the largest e-recruitment companies in the Western world. And before I was based in Silicon Valley heading our investment activities for Axel Springer there. And before that, I lived quite some time in Frankfurt working for McKinsey and advising executive boards in their digital transformation. And we just, uh, found out with Josh that we have quite some uh, common friends. So the world indeed is very small. Yeah, back from my time in Frankfurt, exactly. Uh -huh. And last but not least, Joanne, I mean, ironically enough, I think Joanne lives five blocks from me. And yet due to this current <laughs> crisis, I haven't seen her in <laughs> three, two months. So Joanne, welcome. Tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, thanks, Josh. So I'm the director of HPI New York, which is part of the Hustle Plattner Institute for digital engineering at the University of Potsdam in Germany. Um, I like to think of HPI as a place where research, education, and innovation coalesce. And with respect to today's topic, our work is right in the thick of things. Um, um, the Hasso Plattner Institute for Digital Health at Mount Sinai and their colleagues have created a COVID-19 app to track the spread of the coronavirus across New York City. Um, our School of Design Thinking is partnering with MIT um, for a COVID-19 um, COVID hackathon. And our HPI school cloud, which is being used by around 3, 300,000 students and teachers at the moment, and the World Health Organization uses HPI's uh, MOOC platform to prepare frontline responders, as well as the general public. Great, great. And, and, and what's so interesting about that is we're already starting to see this theme of when we think about kind of innovation and this crisis, we, only, we, we usually start by thinking of, you know, a vaccine, but clearly, there's so much more to this social, political, economic implications that we're going to talk about today. Great panel, diverse opinions. Looking forward to talking to all of you. I'm going to start out this panel with a bit of a challenging question, which I'm going to push over to Linus. And, you know, I hear so much about what the private market is doing in this crisis. All of these companies, startups doing things. And then the kind of the skeptic in me says, yeah, this is all great, but it's all, as we like to say in English, window dressing it doesn't really matter. What really matters is getting a vaccine and that government keeps things under control. What do you think about that statement, Linus? I mean, I think just historically, the government has played like an enormous role when it comes to huge wicked problems. I mean, it would be bizarre to argue anything else when it comes to like the really pressing issues. Like this has just been the case historically. And I think this case around, I actually think you're wrong that I think like there's an enormous amount of experimentation going on that companies are forced to do something on a very short term basis and come together and collaborate in different kinds of collaborations that used to be extremely unexpected or unlikely only a few months back. I think the big challenge, and we actually have a Harvard Business Review piece coming out on this, is to make sure that these like unlikely collaborations are something that are gonna last beyond the crisis, right? Like now, large pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, tech companies have an incentive to collaborate across industry boundaries, but it's not 100% sure that this is gonna last beyond the crisis. So I think this is something why this is like a managerial problem where you have to learn new things of collaborate with unexpected partners that are gonna last beyond the crisis. And I think that's really like the big challenge that is gonna stick with companies after this. You, you know, I always, you know, each panelist here I could probably talk to for an hour. And as you said that, Linus, a bunch of questions popped into my head. One of which is, and I'll, I'll let you kind of follow up on this is, so do you think there will be a new paradigm for innovation? Um, 
yes, to some extent. Yes, this crisis. Like, yes. Short answer. You asked me to have a short answer, and for now, extremely unnatural. And I think the short answer is yes. And I can elaborate on this for like five minutes. <laughs> you, you, you have to give us a minute. <laughs> I think, you know, but I think what's going to happen now is that some. I mean, you already see this. Like, I'm from Sweden, and a number of Swedish companies, and Sweden is in the moment is relatively hit by the crisis as well, yeah. like many other places. And I think what you see now is that many of the Swedish multinational they cannot export to their other markets that has been like they so been so dependent on and they have to come up with solutions under like enormous time pressure to collaborate mm -hmm. across industry boundaries and i think what they're going to learn is that some of these things that they learn now under this crisis are things that actually work relatively well uh, so there are a number of collaboration on ventilators for example of and and a large uh, multinational ventilators producing that in sweden collaborating with someone who is working on producing trucks which used to be a completely unexpected collaboration. And some of the ideas that are coming out of this are really, really cool ideas mm. that are probably gonna open up different kinds of markets. So hopefully like these ideas of coming up with these unexpected partnerships is something that can really change and create a new model of innovation for the years to come. Great, great, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, Sean, I'm gonna go over to you because I feel like in a way the question I asked Linus is also kind of directed toward you, which is like, you know, I've seen a lot of activity coming out of New Lab um, and as a response to this crisis. And, you know, again, I'll pose that skeptical question to you. Does it really make a difference? Yeah. I already, I mean, I already know your answer, but I'll ask anyway. <laughs> no, I, I think the skepticism is totally valid. I think in the majority of cases, the intent is good. Like p these companies, whether they're startups up to large corporations, government bodies are hoping to have a positive impact across like a global fight. Um, and so I don't think the window dressing is probably not totally fair. I think where the debate comes in is the productivity of those efforts, the output of those efforts. And for us, like we've had four or five major initiatives that we've launched um, throughout the last three months to help New York fight back against the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And the, and the productivity of those efforts has been due to a combination of departments and perspectives coming together. It's been government partnering with startups and early technologists, with academic researchers, with large multinational corporations. Each on their own can have an impact for sure. You can do the best you can do. A single department in a company can try to change the company's trajectory on its own. Right. But greater results will always come if they collaborate and share insights across multiple different kind of perspectives and departments or initiatives. And that's, I mean, our innovation studios and our venture studios, the one fundamental piece consistent through all of them is that there's large corporate stakeholders at the table, there's startups, entrepreneurs, early technology being developed that has yet to be prototyped or piloted. There's government bodies who have to help clear red tape, find mm. ways to push this to market, get through regulatory approvals. Um, and then there needs to be a convener and an executor who has access to all these players to bring them together. And that's often the role we play. So if you look at our efforts, we built 3,000 ventilators, a new company, a new product alternative to $30,000 ventilators in five weeks. The mm. new lab wasn't the one that did it. It was new lab, Boyce, uh, 10X right. Beta, the Partnership Fund for New York, the EDC in New York, all of these different public private entities coming together with a single initiative. And in those examples, there's very, very uh, valuable output that's worth kind of celebrating versus being skeptical of. And I, and I think what's really fascinating is if you go back a year ago in both Germany and the US, you know, everywhere, they're constantly trying to push all these entities together and get them to coordinate. But it took a crisis like this to get it to actually happen really efficiently and effectively. And I think that's what that's what's really interesting. Sean, do you, you agree with that? Yeah, I think I mean, I think it's brought people together, certainly with a greater focus. It's also shown what we're capable of. Like, right. if you took this approach to the climate crisis and global warming, like not to get another kind of debate in the, into the panel. But could you imagine if every every country was fo fixated on an outcome there, right. like in the same way we have about a pandemic? The impact has been amazing, like the number of vaccine trials around the world occurring, all coordinating efforts and sharing results. Amazing. Um, it's kind of sad it takes a pandemic killing hundreds of thousands of people to bring us to that type of collaboration. But our hope is that we all learn from that model, that all of us at a table with the right kind of convener and manager of the effort can actually be pretty productive. Right. And that's, and that's this idea of a new paradigm for innovation in which the ecosystem works together more effectively. That's great. Uh, Joanne, I want to move on to you. Like myself, you've spent a number of years working back and forth between Germany and the U.S., 
How do you see the innovation or tech ecosystems between the two different countries handling things differently? Are they similar? Are they same? What have you observed? Um, well, you know, let me let me maybe give you a start with an example um, or two. Um, for, with, let's start with Germany. Um, you know, when tech companies and organizations in Germany um, recently proposed an online hackathon to find solutions to the COVID crisis. Um, German politicians, right away, they seized on this opportunity, and within days, they, they launched Germany's first government-hosted hackathon. Um, and I think some of you know about that. It was called We versus Virus, or Virus. And the effort not only produced viable and useful technical solutions, um, but it also empowered thousands and thousands of participants to actually take action and to learn and, and to create alongside others. And, you know, and this social in innovation approach really brought together government, civil society, private sector. And, and it was, and, and again, as I mentioned, it was the German government that hosted and played a significant role in the coordination. And I think that's one strength, you know, that the, the German government has been doing really a good job of coordinating. Um, and the hackathon that I mentioned, it came together within four days and there were about 43,000 people signed up. I mean, I think wow. about 26, 27 actually participated. Um, but, but you can see that convening power of the government. I mean, Sean mentioned a different example. There was also convenience. There's also convening power here outside the government a lot more. Um, you know, that, and, and I mean, I think the government um, has played a different role in, in the Germany than in the U.S. Um, I mean, I can go on with an example in the U.S. I think Sean gave one, but National Institutes of Health also launched a private public partnership between federal researchers and about 16 pharmaceutical companies. And the goal of that initiative was to coordinate and accelerate the development of COVID-19 treatments um, and uh, vaccines. So, so. so we essentially see, we see a mixture in both countries, but more of a bias toward government kind of activity and government pushing things in Germany, which is what we'd probably expect if we had, had to make a prediction. Yeah, exactly. Great. Great. So going on to Guza really quickly, I want to move this in a slightly different direction. Now, obviously, we've seen there's been a lot of social implications for this. Children are staying home. They have to be educated at home. Parents have to take care of their children at home. And what seems to be the result is, for better or worse, or probably for worse, a disproportionate amount of those activities or those home duties seem to be falling on women. And Gulza, I know that you have worked on some technological initiatives or some kind of initiatives within the techn technological ecosystem to address this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, sure. So um, I first of all think that there's a lot of pressure on both fathers and mothers. And um, I really have to say that I see that more and more companies are now also trying to solve this challenge by providing childcare themselves. I mean, I spring a hazard. Uh, child care, but I know that Kanye, for example, just started offering child care and I think that is also bringing in or bringing on innovation and, and also support for parents that will last beyond this crisis. And I, but I also do believe that there's disproportionate pressure on women and mothers, definitely. And um, what I did is I started one year ago, Access Finger Women, which is an international network for women supporting them, particularly in their leadership careers in topics such as equal pay. And we have made some impact at Axis Springer and cooperate with some other networks here with Microsoft, et cetera. And we started now a virtual, let's say leadership series, because what I recognized when I talked to colleagues is that there's a lot of anxiety, pressure, and also insecurity, whether doing homeschooling or looking after the children and performing at work will both work at the same time. And this leadership series, this virtual leadership series is uh, supposed to support them and also motivate them. So for example, in our first series, we had Sherazad Simsad of Bossesson. She is um, a CEO of one of our portfolio companies, which is a joint venture with Politico US, um, Politico Europe. And she talked about her challenges, both in professional and private life and how she deals with it. Also with, with the topic of children, et cetera. And after this, I got very positive feedback that most of the colleagues had the impression, hey, we are not alone. Our CXOs face the same challenges and we got very hands-on tips on how to deal with that. And I think um, this is something that I'm very proud of that we can achieve this by the technological possibilities that that's, that's terrific so what you're essentially saying is that you know with the you know with virtual communication 
right? With this opportunity to educate people kind of essentially across the globe, you're able to drive lasting impact, especially for women who are disproportionately affected. I think that's terrific. Definitely. And it, at the same time, it's good for the company. So if I would talk to my boss, the board member of Axel Springer, I would say it's also good for us and the ROI because obviously women then are more motivated and this increases directly their productivity. So Terrific. I think Terrific. it's the case. <laughs> Terrific. Let, let's keep moving along that topic of education. And, you know, anyone can really jump in this and any of these questions, of course, but I'm going to turn it over to, to Joanne. Um, Joanne, I understand that HPI has a few initiatives related to kind of home education. Can you talk to us a little bit about this? I mean, obviously, again, to go back to a prior point I made before, we tend to think about these things merely in terms of the implications of this crisis, merely in terms of kind of getting sick and getting treated. But really, there are so many more implications. And it seems to me that HP seems to, HPI seems to be stepping up in this regard. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on, what you've been doing? Yeah, sure. So yeah, HPI has been doing a lot of innovative work including research in the field of education, especially online learning. Um, you know, we have a MOOC platform called OpenHPI, which is also used by the World Health Organization, SAP. We have hundreds of free courses on, on that platform in English and German. Um, but what I wanted to talk specifically about something called Schulcloud um, or School Cloud, which was in, in 2017, HPI started developing Schulcloud with financial support from the BMBF or the Federal Ministry of Education and Research and in collaboration with Mint EC schools. And Mint is the German equivalent of STEM. So those are special schools that were given this Mint designation or STEM designation. And we developed this and, and we're really important, which um, HPI, you know, we have with our School of Design Thinking, we were doing co-creation. We weren't creating for without the teachers and the students, with students and teachers were part of the creation process. And, you know, we really go to the people using the product and find out what are their needs. Um, and we had conferences with the students and teachers to see what was working, what wasn't. And now as a result, um, schools throughout Germany, um, about 300,000 people more, more or less are using this, this platform. But one of, I'm just gonna talk about one thing I really love about it. Sure. Um, you know, if you're teaching, I'll give you an example. You're teaching about, it's all the subjects in a German high school are in there. And let's say you're teaching about the heart in a biology class. You can, you can basically find out what slides, what images, what podcasts, what videos other teachers are using um, in that. So for teacher, from the teacher perspective, it's fantastic. It takes a lot of time away from your prep work. And, um, and, you, and you can also see which are the most used videos or which are the most used graphs. So, so it's a really great platform. And also we're finding that students, in addition to doing their homework, they do their homework online, teachers can correct it online, there's chat functions. But in addition, we've even found a few examples of students getting so excited that they're collaborating, let's say doing a physics project without even being asked by their teacher. So this is a really great platform that's being used. Hey, Joanne, that's great. And I want to I wanna come back to an interesting comment you made there, which is, you know, you talked about this idea that, you know, that teachers can actually share what they're teaching. So if we look at the tradi traditional teaching model, it's, you know, teachers going to their classrooms, maybe talking to a couple of their peers, right? And essentially working in isolation, maybe occasionally going to a workshop. But what you're essentially saying to us now is that not only is COVID requiring a change where teachers need these tools, but also this is something that could significantly impact the way teachers teach and learn way well into the future, because suddenly they'll be, have access to all of this material. Correct. And, and easy access. I mean, you can really get it at, at your fingertips. And, um, and also, it really took COVID to get schools on board. I mean, we were, we were testing it with the Mint schools yep. or STEM yep. schools, but now yep. they really, you know, it's, it's, it's being used very widely. Great, great. Kind of a new paradigm oh, again. Yeah, that? please, by all means. Sorry, I hope I didn't disrupt. No. Uh, so, <laughs> so because Joanne talked about the uh, We for Virus hackathon, there will be another hackathon of a good friend of mine, of Verena Pauster, called We for School in the first week of June. And it's about the community coming together and developing solutions for homeschooling, so to say. And the winners will be awarded and solutions, and I think this is huge, will be um, provided for free to schools on a, on a website. And so if there is someone interested here in this audience to join, it will be the first week of June. So I really think- What is that uh, called again? Just so pardon? everyone can get, what is that called one more time? Just so everyone can get it? It's called Wir für Schule. I just translated okay. it. Okay, yeah. Wir uh, für Schule. Yep. Or yep. Wir für Schule, exactly. Yep, great, okay. Thanks for that. I, I wanna go back to Linus for a second. Linus has a, 
kind of, um, you know, a university educator. What do you think the future of university education looks like now? I mean, how are we going to keep, what are universities doing in order to make sure that their students are getting educated and prepare for the future? I mean, mo many universities are moving to some of the things that are already been mentioned on, like, blended learning on, I mean, we, ESMT has already moved in this direction of making like super interactive learning to prevent Zoom fatigue of sitting and just listening in front of the camera for a full day. I would jump from my house on the seventh floor if I would be forced to sit here and just listen to someone <laughs> talk for a full day. And I think like we built in lots of interactions. And I think this is, that is something that's coming tremendously on how can you keep someone actually hooked onto you what you do by making it super interactive online. And I think that's something that we already moved and I think that's like a big trend. And I see some of my academic colleagues being surprised that they have a hard time getting people like hooked onto their lecture that goes on for three hours, just standing there and sitting like slides after slide after slide and have some questions in the end. And I think that's like not gonna happen. Uh, obviously, it's going to be a major challenge. Like, I mean, to be honest, like universities have not really changed for the last 50 years. And I think it's been one of these colossus with one of the highest margins in the world, um, extremely expensive uh, to go to university and has been very, very little innovation. <laughs> Healthcare probably being the other example as well. And now I think we're forced to innovate at a much greater scale in order to keep up with like, the demand and being able to actually reach out to the students that are distant from us. And I think the challenge is obviously to make sure for, at least from our perspective, to make sure that you actually can live up to the expectations to actually pay something so that you can do something that is above like the free solutions that are out there. Yeah. So I think it's also quite honestly gonna be like a shakeout of many is like second tier or third tier schools. They're gonna have a hard time to uh, actually attract enough students. Because they don't have and that brand. The, the product may not have changed. The price point has gone up 1400% over 15 years or whatever it is in the Which US. Which is crazy, I right? I mean, this is something that is completely insane. And I think, I mean, my child's education that they get today is not very different from the one that I got when I was a kid. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a result of a public system in Sweden. And then I went to a like, very expensive school in the US for my postdoc. And honestly, like, the, does the education that I attended, was it worth it for more than the name on the network? I'm not 100% sure it was that much better than the public university that I had in Sweden. And obviously you have to provide like additional kinds of value on top of it. And I think that's gonna be harder when you are more distant from the students. Thanks, Linus. Um, that, that's great. And by the way, I could talk to you about this theme for hours, which we don't have, unfortunately. Um, so we, we touched a little bit on education. I want to talk about going back to work, kind of the corporate space and what it's like working. So, so obviously, there are many of us. I mean, I'm sitting in my apartment right now with wonderful New York City views and a blue giant in the background, as you can see. Um, the, the question I have is, how are we going to manage getting back to the office from a technological point of view. And Sean, kind of having spoken to you, I thought what you were telling me last week is fascinating about what New Lab is doing to, in order to ensure the safety of those going back to work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, our efforts in this area fall into that same kind of ingredient structure where we partnered with government here locally, the ESD and the Partnership Fund for New York and EDC to understand kind of where there were knowledge gaps or confusion around what we could do with technology to bring people back to workplaces safely. Then we went out and looked at all the technologists developing anything from sensors to different approaches to data pipes and questionnaires and contact tracing and tried to figure out what's out there that could develop the most robust return to work program. And then how could we use New Lab as a pilot location and then work with larger corporations to figure out how do you scale this to something more significant. Because if you haven't been to New Lab, it, it actually fits kind of nicely between a factory and an office park or a typical workplace. This is an 85,000 square foot building with 90 foot ceilings, but it also has offices throughout that people come to work to, um, on a daily basis. And so we had 75 essential workers working on COVID-19 related efforts out of our 850 people. So we went down to the small subset but the question was still there of how do you have 75 people come to work every day during a pandemic and do it in a responsible and safe manner. And so we really looked at a bunch of different kind of step points. First, we looked at what do you do before you get to work? So we developed a questionnaire for everyone to have on their phone. How are you feeling this morning? Who have you been in touch with? Where have you traveled? And I get up every morning and I fill out that questionnaire on my phone before I get to work. 
Then I come to the front desk of, of New Lab and there's security there that takes my temperature with a contactless thermometer. And there's also a camera installed above every door um, by Norbert Health that takes my heart rate and my, uh, and my temperature reading um, to make sure both of those two, um, the manual approach and the camera-based computer vision approach are identical and are taking the right oh, wow. temperature reads. Then I put on a sensor, like I have one on me right now. Um, mm -hmm. And I wear this all day while I'm in the building. It's developed by strong arm technology. And these guys built this for factory workers to avoid uh, factory in injuries. Like if you're in a temperature level that's dangerous, noise levels, your muscular or skeletal movement is gonna continue to degrade your body. It'll give you immediate feedback, but then also you dock the sensor at the end of every day and upload your movements and behavior to the cloud so that they can look at where risk is occurring in any workplace. So we asked them, can you change the tech to be relevant to COVID-19? We wanted to do two things. We want it to tell me every time I come within six or seven feet of another person so that I actually become aware when I'm not socially distancing appropriately. And I want you to be able to historically contact trace. So mm -hmm. if I go home tonight and I get 104 fever and I notify New Lab that I've become sick, can you go look at everyone who came near me? And can you have them quarantined for 10 to 14 days? Can you look at every, I sat in this office for six hours. Can you deep clean this office, but you don't have to deep clean every other office because I didn't go in those. And so that's what the sensor allows is not only like immediate feedback of, of where my behavior is dangerous, but then also allows me to historically contact trace when someone does become infected. And, and so that whole combination, as you see, we needed government, we needed large corporations to see how we can test this to a larger workplace. We needed early stage technology to be prototyped and piloted in a responsible manner. And we needed someone to run the whole thing, which was, which was what New Lab stepped in and did. And so that's where we are today, where 75 people come here every day, go through all of these different kind of approaches and safety mechanisms. Uh, and so far, it's been very well received by the people here. They feel safe. And everyone who's reviewed this approach has said there's nothing that goes more aggressive and more appropriate in technology and health and safety than what, we, what we've essentially developed so far. That's amazing. That's great, Sean. So you can feel safer. I mean, people are more productive when they feel safer. It's terrific. Um, Gulza, I wanna, I wanna go back to you for a second. I know you're very involved in kind of the investing side of things. Can you tell us about any companies you've invested in or are investing in that somehow have changed or pivoted or are responding or are a good opportunity in terms of the current investment crisis, excuse me, the current yeah, COVID crisis? Happy to do so. So first of all, I really think that it's important that investors, be it us, corporate investors, but also financial investors continue to invest to keep the tech and startup ecosystem up and running and to also prevent insolvencies. And actually we did one of our fastest deals ever. So we acquired a company within less than three weeks because it's really, it hits the nerve of the current time. We acquired a video conferencing technology called Cameo. You might say now, oh, okay, video conferencing. I mean, everybody uses Zoom and Microsoft Teams, etc. But this is a particular tool designed for our clients looking to hire people. So it doesn't, does not only have live video conferencing um, functionalities, but also time shifted. Especially we see that industries like healthcare or um, food retail are looking to hire a huge number of employees and not only like the simplest job profiles, but also more complex ones. And they don't have the time currently to do in-person interviews so they can record the main questions and really scale the interview part and then analyze it via AI and speech to text technology. Wow. Wow. And this really, really, really well taken. And obviously at, at Access Springer and as Stepstone, our mission is to enable all companies to hire the best employees whenever and in which situation whatsoever. So I think this is a great tool and the feedback so far is amazing. And I, I, that was definitely a very, very, very fast year. Yeah, and, and what's fascinating about that is if, again, if going back to Joanne's example before, if you think about it, that's a technology that probably was being thought about for years or being developed for years or people had the idea for years, but it's only now during the current crisis exactly. that it's actually going to take off and it's here to stay. Even once we're over this crisis, it's still going to be part of the fabric of the way we hire people. That's terrific, Gulza. Let me actually go on to Joanne. We're running down on time. What we'll probably do is we'll probably do about three or four minutes of discussion. Then we will go to Q&A for the remainder of the time. So if you have any questions, you know, you can jot them down. Joanne, I want to go to you now. 
tell me about your approach. We talked about, Sean was talking a little bit about, you know, st staying distant in the office, but one of the problems we have is how do we go to the doctor, right? We have to go to the doctors now. What does that look like? How is HPI working to solve that challenge? Well, yeah, so HPI, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we have our digital health center, um, our digital health team. And um, there's actually one, one project I just found out about last week um, during a during a call, we had a, a conference which was with Stanford and HPI, and um, there's a HPI research group under um, Dr. Jonathan Edelman, who is they're developing a, a platform for telemedicine, but also to better understand team dynamics. And they track facial action units, gaze, head pose, skeletal movements, text, and voice. And you know, although I don't have time to go into all the details, I think one one important. Um, area is the ability to interpret behavior at a much deeper level. And I guess if you think about, let's say, a psychologist who's working with a patient online versus in person, you know, a lot of cues can be missed. So when you, you know, when you have this kind of technology, it helps a lot in terms of understanding what's going on. Terrific, terrific. And I love it. Again, I love it. We keep coming back to this theme that these are innovations that are here to stay and are going to completely change the way we do things and make and hopefully make lives better, right? Everything we seem to have mentioned Probably, I mean, maybe excluding, you know, Sean's um, the discussion about how they're going to the workplace now, all of those, but again, that could be used in the event of another crisis, all of these will have long lasting implications for us and, and our society. So that's terrific. Um, I want to end with one kind of simple question. And it's the following and you can, you know, take a minute or so to give me your answer. So the question is, tech to the rescue. Yes or no, and of course you can say more than yes or no, Linus, when it comes to you. Um, tech to the rescue, is, is tech gonna save us? Joanne, since you're already here, why don't we start with you? Well, I think in some cases it already has. I mean, if you think of uh, 3D printing of personal protective equipment, that's just one example. Also, a number of research projects are using AI to identify drugs that were developed to fight other diseases, but which can now be repurposed to take on coronavirus, um, you know, that those are two examples. Um, by studying the molecular setup of existing drugs with AI, uh, companies want to identify which ones might disrupt uh, the way yep. COVID works. You know, and this is so. This is a use of AI, um, which is already being done. Gulza. Yeah, sure. So to, to keep it very short and simple, I mean, if there wasn't any tech, we wouldn't be able to talk now. And I think tech also right. keeps the economy up and running. And I'm really impressed on how far the collaboration tools have gone and how how professional they are to be very honest um i have some days that I, when i don't miss i'm currently in the office but some days i really do not miss the office because it's so much more efficient um, i shouldn't say that too loud because my colleagues might hear it but um, i think tech to the rescue also in our everyday lives yes okay and i guess your colleagues aren't watching then <laughs> uh, I hope not. Uh, just my okay. <laughs> Sean, tech to the rescue. I mean, to me, technology is it's a tool, um, and it can be used for good or bad. It depends how it's managed, how it's deployed, how it's organized. Um, the, it's it's a hammer. You can build things with a hammer, or you can hurt people with one. It just depends who's who's got the hammer in their hand. Um, and so, I don't think it's tech to the rescue in regards to it alone will save us all. It requires, um, you know, significant collaboration and partnership for technology to be deployed in a scalable and impactful manner. The, the move fast and break things era is over. Like move fast and break Western democracy is not something anyone's proud of yet. And the tech lash, at least that we've seen in the US, is that standing up and saying technology will save everyone is no longer really well received. Right. Technology in partnership with government, in partnership with what people actually need, not what's profitable. Um, another app that changes, you know, computer vision so we can add animal filters to our face is not going to solve much. But, but it'll if make the me right really parties happy. come together to collaborate, <laughs> ignoring yep. technology is a fundamental error. Like ignoring the hammer when trying to do something is not the wise way to go. But don't think the hammer alone is going to solve anything. I love it. That's a great way to look at it. Great. And Linus? I mean, one technology problem to solve is when my kids are calling the front door like 20 <laughs> times when I'm home alone. That would be great if someone solved this. And I think that but actually echoing Sean's point, because it is not only a technology problem and technology is like a hammer and a tool, right? 
then it means that this is a managerial problem and a fundamentally human problem. And that's why it's extremely hard, I think, to also keep some of the lessons from what we do now, because I think there is a risk that we go back to normal afterwards. And like some of the lessons that we learn now, are hopefully are going to be a lot more lasting. It's not so easy to focus with the kids. I love it. It's, I love it, Lena. It's no problem. So I'm sorry, repeat the last thing you said again. No, but because it is a managerial problem, I think this is the challenge to actually making sure that when things are we back to normal in the office, that some of the lessons that we learn now, that some of the collaborations that we do now are actually going to stick into the future. I think that's going to be the really pressing challenge because we have these big problems like global warming yep, yep. and inequality and all of these things that are fundamental and really big societal problems that are going to have to be solved. And we need to think about this as a managerial problem as well and not only as a technological problem. Terrific, terrific, all great answers. At this point, let's go over to Q&A. If you have any questions for any of the individual panelists or all of the panelists, feel free to jot them in using that Q&A function. The only thing I would ask is that you keep, try to keep your, your questions rather short. I see a few questions here that are kind of paragraph long. It's a little difficult for us to get to them. So it would be great if you have any questions, please put them in there. Panelists, if you see any of those questions that you feel in a good position to answer, by all means, but I will try to read them off. So questions from the audience. The investment one's pretty interesting, Josh. You want to take that? Sure, Sean. Well, uh, I think also kind of started down this path as well is that I have like a career of two halves. I spent half of it in travel and the latter half in frontier technology, pretty weird bridge, but we all make some odd turns every once in a while. Um, if you're in the travel industry, I'm on the board or advise five or six companies. Most of them have lost 80% of their revenue in three months. Like the entire businesses have been destroyed. I also have companies here at New Lab where their product, like the educational aspects and products we've been discussing, have just had massive fuel added to the fire. Sean, they, can I interrupt uh, you for one second? Just yeah. I want to give the background on the questions. Oh, um, yeah, go for it. The background of the question is um, Ancon from ES and MTC says there's a credit crunch right now, and US Treasury rates have fallen. It may take oh, quite some time to recover. The question is, where are the investments for innovation coming from? So let's go back to you, Sean. Thanks for that. Totally, because the question is totally right, which is out of 155 companies here, survival right now, the first question is how much dry powder do you have? When was the last time you raised? And if yep. you raised money a month ago before the crisis, you're in good spot. Nothing to do with your business, just luck and happenstance that your fundraising closed right before a pandemic. If you closed three, uh, three years ago and you're about to kick off your fundraising in May, you're in a really rough spot. And that has nothing to do with the technology, the product or their strategy. But what has happened now is certain products have gone from being interesting to being just required. Um, farm Shelf is a company here that builds seven foot vertical farming units for growing leafy green produce in your own home. Kind of a luxury nice to have before a pandemic. Now suddenly everyone wants an avenue to grow their own produce and have a better food supply chain that they can actually manage and control. And so that company suddenly sees interest in investing. These guys building these sensors, a lot of people suddenly interested in their technology and investing. So the investment kind of environment hasn't frozen. There's still people interested. It's just shifted dramatically of the type of products they're looking for. And it's gone to the point where investors are setting the price. Like what's the valuation? Is it a down round? Like they are in the driver's seat because uh, beggars can't be choosers in that yeah. kind of environment. The second yep. piece is there is a lot of government grants and access to capital from a government perspective that is difficult to find, difficult to apply for, but if you figure it out, can be very substantial yeah. in an impact. The first million dollars in funding we got to build 3,000 ventilators for New York hospitals came from a government grant. It came from the New York EDC. It didn't come from a venture capital firm. It was non-dilutive capital. And the more you look at these different programs from the DOD, like Army, Navy grants, all the way through different uh, government departments, there's a lot of opportunity out there. But it is rough. It is definitely the roughest fundraising environment I've seen in a while. Great. Let me go back to a, let me, let me jump in on another question, maybe for all of you from John Gore. John Gore asks, which technology or products are here to stay and which will disappear once life returns to normal? Bit of a uh, prognostication question. Anyone uh, have any ideas there? I mean, I think, it's, I think it's pretty easy to say what's here to stay. So maybe if you want to talk about that, like significant changes where you think they're going to stick around, maybe that's the easiest. 
think probably to what, what I said before, right? I mean, the collaboration tools. I mean, obviously we had Microsoft Teams years before, but we never really used it. We had phone calls, that's about it. And now we are using it very intensely. And I would say it's here to stay in that, probably not in that full intensity, but definitely more intense than before. And the reason is very simple. We at Axel Springer, and I see that in all our portfolio companies globally, are now re rethinking what mobile office and um, office days means. So we are rethinking the way of working. We are rather thinking of having office days than mobile office days. And I really think that collaboration tools will, will stay and will develop further and um, yeah. But what's interesting there to think about for a second is if you think about the trickle down effect of something like that, which means that if people stop, if offices are used less, then that means the real estate market changes. That means the businesses around those real around those locations change. I mean, and so we can see there's huge implications of all of these changes. Definitely. And it's a saving effort, right? I mean, we calculated how much um, we, money we would save if we would, uh, let's say, um, not need all the office and have, let's say, more like a mobile office mm, policy sure, sure. that um, says that office days are the exception rather than vice versa. I mean, obviously, these are extremes and these are thought scenarios and it's not like decided. But um, I really think that the going back to normal, there will be no old normal anymore. I think the yeah. old yep. normal will be new. Got it. Anyone else want to jump in on that um, question? I, I actually, uh, Josh, as I told you at the beginning, I will have to excuse myself because I have to give a talk oh, now. Oh, of course. So, um, apologize, apologies to everyone. Thank but you thank so you. much for being here, Joanne. Thank you so much. Jo Joanne Bye -bye. Halpern, thank you so much. Terrific. Let's, Bye -bye. anyone else have anything else on that question? If not, we have another, a few more, which I think are quite interesting. No? Okay. I like, uh, oh, Nico Luma from, from Hamburg. Uh, I hope you're well, Nico. Good to see your name here. Um, how does venture capital have to change to adapt to the challenges of the future instead of just focusing on big returns? So, I mean, the first piece I would call out is like the generalization that all VCs just focus on big returns is, is kind of off a little. In regards to, there's just a lot of flavors of venture capital firms and their theses can differ. You can have double bottom line investors who are actually have LPs that are only interested in investments that have some additional positive kind of impact on the world in regards to not just like positive financial returns. So I, I think you do have those type of venture funds out there that have focused it on focused on positive efforts, um, not just returns overall. But I think what venture capital firms will do in general is we'll understand the two pieces you just talked about, which is what is normal for the future and what will become a tool or an asset that will continue to be valued because of what we've just learned. There's going to be a lot more investing in a lot of the things we've talked about today, virtual education, work from home solutions. There's definitely a dividing line. If you have kids, you definitely don't want to work from home. I, I have a two-year-old and I've been gagging to get back to the office. I also have a two-year-old. There you go. So I, I meet a lot of people who say like, I am dying to get back to the office. And then I meet people without kids who are like, I never want to go back. And so I think there is a little bit of a balance that will happen there. But I think they're going to look at this as what are the tools and technologies that are now here to stay? Like what are people actually going to adopt permanently and how do we invest in them quickly? The second is they're going to look at um, distressed assets. They're going to look at this company's running out of money. I can demand equity at whatever valuation I want. I'm going to go invest in, in assets in the distressed market. I've heard from four or five people building funds in the travel space, literally to buy companies that are about to go out of business, mothball them and open them back up in 18 months at an incredible return because you're picking up something that in the long term right. will return to its previous value. Right. So I think you're starting to see that type of behavior that is seeing opportunity. Um, and then I think you see the lens of what's the next one like this going to look like? This is not going to be the only virus yeah. that spreads globally. We clearly have found out this is, this is a situation that's here to stay. And so what are the investment opportunities in the infrastructure of society that prepare us for the next one? Um, and I think that type of behavior you're seeing across very, very, a wide range of firms right now. Great. Probably also to add on that, I think as an investor, you also have to now, at least we really think also of a portfolio composition and how important it is that you don't, do not only have similar assets in your portfolio, but also very diverse assets. I mean, we see it in the crisis. We have some companies that are performing extremely well and some others like the travel industry, we are not invested there anymore, but still that are really low performers. But in total, 
our situation is not too bad because of our diverse portfolio. So I think venture capitalists also will look at their portfolio and see are we are we ready for a crisis and are we diverse enough in our portfolio? Computer. Terrific. I'm going to do one last question, just in the interest of time. Sure, I, I always like to end these. Oh, Linus, I was going to go to you anyway. One so, thing that I've seen sure, some sure. sort of playing around with more prediction markets when there's like, now there's like fundamental uncertainty, like no one knows what's going to happen. It's like incredibly difficult to look into the future. And I think one thing that is maybe coming to a greater extent is to have more of prediction markets. Like these are like the different kinds of options that may exist and have more skin in the game. For example, if we would have done this for all 85 attendees, about what the next crisis is going to be like and what kinds of technologies are going to predict. Like you and I are probably going to be pretty off the mark, but like collectively, I'm pretty certain that I could have designed this to make pretty good predictions about what the future is actually going to bring, right? And I think that's something that I've seen more investors actually moving in this direction in the biotech sphere before the crisis. And I think that's something that you may see even more now, given that there's so much uncertainty. Great. Thank you, Linus. I'm going to ask one more question, and I'd ask you to kind of keep your answers to under 45 seconds, again, just in the interest of time and making sure we finish on time. Jo Joachim asks, do you think we will go back to normal post the crisis? How can we ensure tech lessons learned will be used effectively in the future? That in and of itself, by the way, could have been a panel, right? We could have had an hour-long panel discussion on that, so I'm putting you under a bit of pressure. But how do we ensure the tech lessons learned will be used effectively in the future? Like, do we go back to normal? How do we make sure those lessons stick around? Linus, you want to start? I think some people are going to go back to normal. I think for many people are not, right? Like much of the data that is now coming out that has been collected in the last couple of weeks, I think there are enormous heterogeneous treatment effects to use like the academic lingo yeah. that some people think that is going to change like everything that they do. And many people think that once things are back to normal, it's going to be exactly the same. For the big lessons, I think as I saw John and I talked about this before about like learning from the managerial experiences, like what can you actually learn from what you've done and draw inferences from what worked and what didn't work. I think that's going to be the really, really important thing for to make lessons that go beyond this one. I can think I can elaborate on this for a long time, but I think there's a <laughs> chance that many of us are going to start different things that are not going to last beyond the crisis. I and mean, if you don't think very carefully about what worked, what didn't work, for what kinds of reasons, is it within our scope or control, or is it because of some other kind of unexpected event? Great. Sean, over to you. Yeah, I, mean, I think the question is probably looking at two different normals, right? One is normal society behavior, how we all go to work and where we go to eat and things like that, and, and what type of recovery or or change is going to happen in that area. And then the other normal, I think, is around innovation and technology and how it's used in, in challenging situations. Um, so on the latter, like how we innovate, I think a lot of people have learned that bringing all these bodies together can have a pretty significant impact. There's been examples across the planet of how collaboration across different boundaries and lines that have typically not been, um, not been pushed through have provided better outcomes. And I really hope that becomes the new normal. I, I'm skeptical just because we can all fall back to the old ways and focus on the profitability of our corporation. But I feel like companies have also realized this can be profitable. AstraZeneca getting a billion dollars to build 300 million vaccines in the US is both profitable and good for the, the country. And so I think that there has been insights into the upside there. So I hope that we continue to have bodies bringing people together to innovate with all the right people at the table, but I'll hold a bit of skepticism. And then the second piece, I know I got about 10 seconds. On the normal <laughs> of society, do I think I'll be wearing a sensor a year from now to come to work every day? No, I, I think there are a lot of things we're doing right now that are stop gaps until there's a commonly available vaccine. And, and then a lot of these pieces get peeled back, but with a focus to the future of how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? I mean, Jesus, like from January in Wuhan to 100,000 people dying as of yesterday in the US, we must be better at this next time. There's gotta be a more kind of systematic and well-researched approach to this. Great, and Gulza, last but not least. Very shortly, very shortly. So I think that um, the current crisis really, really accelerated the digitization of very established industries and areas. And people are becoming or are starting to see the advantages. And I think these innovations are here to stay. And um, if I think of this whole online education thing, online recruiting, etc., or the whole topic of how much space do we need. So I think 
you do not really have to do a lot beyond the fact that people are seeing the advantages, living them, and also, even though you might be asked to go back to office or to go back to school, people will ask for it anyhow. So I think it will auto, let's say, become an own dynamic and will be established also after the crisis, meaning that the new normal is really a new normal and not the old normal. I love it. Well, great way to end. Great way to end this topic. Um, Lena Stalander, Sean Stewart, Gules of Ilka, and of course, Joanne Halpern. Thank you so much for your time, for your expertise. It was amazing. I learned from you. Um, terrific having you. I hope we can all connect again soon. And of course, thank you so much to ESMT and Atlantic Bloca for co-hosting this panel along with me from Giant Innovation. I wish you all a healthy and safe rest of the week. And if you have any questions, reach out to any of us. Bye-bye. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, bye.